You know, it's funny how often truth turns out to be even wilder than anything we could make up. It really is. And that's what we're diving into today. We're tackling a whole bunch of unsolved mysteries. And these aren't just your average ghost stories. Oh, no. These are cases that have stumped even the most experienced investigators, and for decades, no less. Get ready to have your mind blown, because we're going straight to the source. Unexplained Book 5 by Robert Keller. And what's amazing about Keller's work is how he takes these real-life mysteries and makes them so captivating. He doesn't just lay out the facts, he digs into all the twists and turns. Exactly. The strange coincidences, the conflicting accounts. He lays it all out there and basically invites us to put on our detective hats right alongside him. It's like he's saying, okay, here's the puzzle, try and figure this one out. So are you ready to get started? Because I'm itching to jump into our first case. And let me tell you, this one still sends chills down my spine just thinking about it. Okay, hit me with it. I know who killed me. Sure. The title alone is enough to pique your curiosity, right? Definitely grabs your attention. So picture this. Yeah. It's 1977 in Chicago. A woman named Teresita Bassa is found murdered. Now, as tragic as that is, it's sadly not all that uncommon, right? But here's where things take a turn for the unexplainable. Okay, I'm listening. What happened? Well, the police were absolutely stumped. No leads, no suspects, nothing. That is, until they received a tip from the most unlikely source you can imagine. Don't tell me. They got a tip from a... A dream. You got it. You're kidding. Nope. Teresita's co-worker, Remy Chua, claimed that Teresita's spirit actually came to her in a dream. No way. What did the ghost say? Well, she urged Remy to go to the police and, get this, she even named her killer. Whoa, hold on a second. A ghost whispering clues from beyond the grave? You can't tell me that's not the start of a truly wild mystery. Oh, it gets even wilder, trust me. <laughs> so Remy's husband, who happened to be a medical doctor, was, as you might imagine, a bit skeptical at first. Dreams? Ghosts? Mm. Not exactly scientific evidence, right? Right. But then, Remy started talking in her sleep. And it wasn't her voice. It was this other voice claiming to be Teresita. And it provided this incredibly specific detail. Okay, what detail? I need to know. The voice said that there was stolen jewelry hidden at the suspect's girlfriend's house. It even described exactly where to find it. Wait a minute. So they had a lead? From a ghost, no less. And they even had details about stolen goods. Did the police actually take this seriously? Oh, they did. And you're not going to believe this, but it led them straight to a guy named Alan Showery, a co-worker of Teresita's. Get out of here. So they brought him in for questioning. They did. And during the interrogation, Showery completely cracked. He confessed to the whole thing, even revealed the location of the hidden jewelry, exactly where the dream had said it would be. No way. Talk about a confession ripped straight from the headlines. That must have been an open and shut case then, right? You'd think so, right? But, of course, it wouldn't be on our show if it were that simple. This is where things take another fascinating turn, even with a confession. Oh boy, here we go. So the defense, understandably, tried everything they could to discredit Remy's dream testimony in court. I mean, can you imagine trying to convince a jury based on a dream? I can see how that would be a tough sell. But here's the thing. The judge actually allowed it. What? Seriously? Seriously. This wasn't just a murder trial anymore. It became this huge cultural debate about whether dreams could actually hold up in court as evidence. Mm. Can you imagine being on that jury? Talk about a legal and existential dilemma. What did the jury end up deciding? They were completely torn. Hung jury? Hung jury. The whole voice from the grave thing was just too much for some of them to accept so they couldn't reach a verdict. Mistrial. However, Showery was facing a retrial. And I guess that was enough to make him nervous because he ended up taking a plea deal. So he went to prison. He, he did. Got 14 years for a murder he might have gotten away with, all thanks to a dream. That's wild. I mean, whether you're a believer in the paranormal or not, there's no denying that Remy's dream had a massive impact on the case. It really makes you think about the power of our own subconscious minds. Absolutely. Are there really these hidden depths within us that we don't even understand? Depths that might even connect us to something bigger than ourselves. It's a question that's both exciting and, I'll admit, a little bit terrifying. I know what you mean. And what I find so brilliant about Keller's writing is that he doesn't shy away from these questions. He uses these real-life cases to really blur the lines between what we can explain and what remains a complete and utter mystery. He leaves us wondering. Exactly. He presents the facts, the oddities, and then steps back and allows us, the readers, to grapple with the possibilities. Oh. And grapple we will. 
From the bustling streets of Chicago, let's switch gears entirely and journey to the unsettling quiet of a seemingly normal family home. Our next deep dive centers around a young boy named Michael Jones, and the title alone sends shivers down my spine. Oh, and what's it called? The Haunted Boy. Okay, yeah, that's not ominous at all. So what's Michael's story? Well, what makes this case so unsettling is how things escalate. It starts subtly, with five-year-old Michael telling his parents he keeps seeing a man in his room. At first, his mother, Denise, just dismisses it as an overactive imagination. Kids and their imaginary friends, right? Right, but I'm guessing it didn't stop there. It did not. Things took a turn when Michael pointed to a photo of his deceased great-grandfather and said, that's the man I see. Oh, wow, okay, that's a little harder to explain away. You got that right. And it just kept getting stranger. Michael started talking about this terrifying shadow man that would visit him at night. And here's the thing. The activity wasn't limited to just Michael anymore. The whole family started experiencing strange and unexplainable things happening in their home. Like what? Give me some chills. Oh, we're talking full-on paranormal activity here. Objects moving on their own, unexplained noises, even the feeling of being touched by unseen hands. Oh, no, thank you. I'd be sleeping with the lights on. The house basically became a hotbed of paranormal activity. Imagine the feeling of dread, of being trapped in your own home with something you can't explain, something you can't control. I can't even imagine. So what did the family do? Denise was desperate for answers, for help. She finally ended up reaching out to paranormal investigators. Paranormal investigators. So they were taking this seriously. They believed something was truly wrong. They did. And after investigating the house, they came to this chilling conclusion. Michael wasn't imagining things at all. They believed he was some kind of conduit attracting malevolent entities to him. A conduit for evil. That's a terrifying thought. What did they suggest the family do? An exorcism. An exorcism. Are we talking full-blown The Exorcist movie now? It, it might seem extreme, but remember, this was a time when belief in the paranormal, especially demonic forces, was a lot more common. That's true. So what happened? Did they go through with the exorcism? They did. The investigators and even a priest, Father McKenna, became convinced that Michael was possessed. Oh, wow. And what happened? Did it work? Was Michael okay? Well, you'd think this is where the story would end, right? The power of belief conquers all. Everyone lives happily ever after. Mm. But, like all good mysteries, it took another turn. The exorcism seemed to bring a temporary peace to the house. But then tragedy struck. What happened? Michael's best friend died. Oh no, that's awful. It was. And after that, the paranormal activity in the house, it intensified, became even more terrifying than before. Oh no, that poor kid. What a horrific thing to experience, especially at such a young age. It makes you wonder, was it really demonic possession or could it have been the trauma and grief manifesting in these paranormal experiences? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It really is. The line between what we consider paranormal and what might be rooted in psychology, it's often blurry, to say the least. Absolutely, and that's what I think makes these cases so endlessly fascinating. And Keller, as always, leaves that final interpretation up to us. Did Michael become a magnet for dark forces, or was it all a young mind trying to process loss and grief in a way that defied explanation? Tough questions. Ah. <laughs> but for our next case, let's shift gears, shall we? We're moving from the supernatural to something that feels, well, a little too real, a little too close to home. Oh, let's hear it. We're diving into the unsettling world of unexplained disappearances. Okay, so whenever I hear about a disappearance case, it always sends shivers down my spine. There's just something so unsettling about the idea of someone just vanishing into thin air. Yeah. You know, it's like they just stepped out of existence. And that's exactly what we're diving into with our next case. Okay, I'm ready. Lay it on me. What's the story? This one's called Warning Signs. And it takes us to the heart of Oklahoma, where a family vanished from their rural property Without a trace. Without a trace. Like, they were just gone. Gone. In 2009, the Jameson family, Bobby, Sherilyn, and their six-year-old daughter, Madison, disappeared from their home. Just poof. Vanished. So what happened? What did the police find? Well, their truck was found abandoned a few miles away from their property. Their dog was inside. And there was a wad of cash, like a significant amount, just sitting there under the driver's seat. Wait, they left cash behind. That's strange. It's like they intended to come back, but then something stopped them. That's exactly what makes this case so baffling. It's like <laughs> those little details that just don't add up, you know? Yeah, it's like a giant question mark. And as investigators dug deeper into the Jameson family's lives, things just got stranger and stranger. How so? What did they find? Well, it turns out that the Jamesons, they were really into the occult. The occult? 
like witchcraft and stuff. Exactly. They even asked their pastor to perform an exorcism on their house because they were convinced it was haunted. Okay, hold on. A haunted house, a missing family. This is giving me some serious The Conjuring vibes. Right. And it gets even creepier. Bobby Jameson, the father, he apparently even asked about buying special bullets. Special bullets? What, like silver bullets for werewolves? Well, not quite. He wanted bullets he could use to shoot spirits. Oh, boy. Okay, yeah. That's a whole other level. So we've got a potential haunting, maybe some paranoia, and then they disappear without a trace. What's the final piece of the well, puzzle here? Oh, there's one more thing. Security footage from their home, just days before they vanished, shows Bobby and Sherilyn acting really strangely. Strangely how? Like they're in a trance, carrying all these random items out to their truck. It's really bizarre. Wow. Okay, so what happened to the Jamison family? Did they ever figure it out? Sadly, no. Years later, their remains were found not far from where their truck was abandoned. Oh no. So what happened to them? Did they determine a cause of death? That's the thing. The bodies were too decomposed to figure out how they died. Was it exposure to the elements? Foul play? A murder-suicide pact fueled by their beliefs in the occult? We're left with more theories than answers. And it's a chilling reminder that sometimes the truth is far stranger and far more unsettling than anything we can imagine. It really makes you wonder what went on behind closed doors and what ultimately led to their tragic end. It does. And it's a reminder that sometimes the most unsettling mysteries are the ones that hit closest to home. Speaking of mysteries, let's shift gears for a moment and dive into a place that's practically synonymous with the unexplained. Oh, and where's that? We're talking about the Bermuda Triangle. Oh boy, the Bermuda Triangle. It's like the ultimate X-Files episode in real life. It really is. And one of the most enduring mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle has to be the disappearance of Flight 19. Flight 19, refresh my memory, which one was that again? Flight 19, also known as the Lost Patrol, was a group of five Navy planes that completely vanished during a routine training mission way back in 1945. Five planes gone just like that that's incredible i mean what are the chances what happened well it was december 5th a seemingly normal day and these five grumman avenger torpedo bombers they took off from fort lauderdale florida the weather was clear the crew was experienced everything seemed totally routine sounds pretty straightforward so what went wrong how does a routine training mission turn into one of the biggest mysteries of the Bermuda triangle that's the million dollar question so, at some point during the flight, the flight leader, Lieutenant Charles Taylor, he radioed in and he said that his compasses had malfunctioned, he was disoriented, couldn't figure out where he was. Compass malfunction in the Bermuda Triangle. It sounds like something straight out of a movie. Right. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the radio transmissions, they reveal that Taylor, he became increasingly panicked. He was convinced that he was over the Gulf of Mexico, but he was way off course. No, oh, no. He was leading them in the wrong direction. Exactly. It was like whatever was happening out there was messing with their navigation. Some people think there was a mechanical failure. Others point to those strange magnetic anomalies they say happened in the triangle. The triangle does seem to have a reputation for messing with electronics. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Did they ever find the planes? Nope. That's the thing. Despite this massive search and rescue operation, they never found a single trace of Flight 19. Vanished just like that. It's those kinds of stories that really make you wonder... Is it just a tragic accident or is there something more, something unexplainable happening out there in the Bermuda Triangle? It's the question that keeps everyone guessing. Right. Right. And, you know, it's a reminder that we still don't have all the answers when it comes to the natural world. But let's shift gears a little bit from the vastness of the ocean to the complexities of the human mind. OK, I'm intrigued. What's next? This next case, On the Run, it centers around a man named Blair Adams. Now imagine you're living your life, everything seems normal, and then suddenly you become absolutely convinced that someone is trying to kill you. Oh, wow. That's chilling. So who was Blair Adams? Was he involved in something dangerous, maybe witness to a crime or something? That's the thing. Up until that point, Blair had a good job. He was in recovery from addiction, had plenty of friends. By all accounts, he's doing well. And then boom, his behavior does a complete 180. Okay. So what kind of changes are we talking about? He became withdrawn, anxious always looking over his shoulder. He complained of insomnia, told his friends that someone was spreading nasty rumors about him, but he wouldn't say who or what the rumors were even about. Wow, so rumors, paranoia, insomnia. That does sound like textbook anxiety. 
But something must have triggered this extreme shift in his behavior, right? That's what makes this case so baffling. There was no clear trigger. But his fear, it just kept escalating. And it reached a fever pitch when he suddenly withdrew all of his savings, sold everything he owned, and fled Canada. He just disappeared. He did. Left his whole life behind. Where did he go? He headed south to the U.S. And along the way, people who encountered him, they reported him acting erratically, claiming that people were after him. He even bought a one-way plane ticket using a fake name. It's like he was trying to disappear completely. Wow, that is a desperate attempt to escape something or someone. Did he ever say who he thought was after him? That's the thing. He never did. And sadly, Lair's story, it doesn't have a happy ending. Wow. A few days after he fled Canada, his body was found in a field in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, the official cause of death was a ruptured stomach. But the circumstances surrounding his death, they're still a complete mystery. Did he take his own life? Or was there something more to it? It's impossible to say for sure. Did his paranoia, his fear, lead him to a tragic end? Or was there a darker truth he was desperately trying to escape? That's a chilling thought. It's like his own mind betrayed him. It's a stark contrast to the other cases we've talked about today, where external forces seem to be at play, whether it was a haunting or the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle. But with Blair Adams, the darkness seemed to come from within. And that can be the most terrifying kind of darkness of all, the kind we carry inside ourselves. But speaking of chilling, let's move on to our next stop. We're going deep beneath the bustling streets of London for this one. London. Okay, what are we diving into now? We're heading into the depths of the London Underground for a story of a runaway train. And the chilling question, was it an accident or something far more sinister? Okay, so a runaway train in the London Underground. That sounds like the stuff of nightmares, especially for anyone who relies on public transportation. It's the kind of scenario you just hope never happens to you, right? Exactly. So tell me more. What are the details of this case? So it's 1975, a typical rush hour at Moorgate Station, one of the busiest stations in the entire London Underground Network. Hundreds of commuters are packed onto this train, everyone just trying to get home, you know? Just another day. Exactly. Until... Suddenly, instead of slowing down as it approached the station, the train actually accelerates, barreling into the station wall at full speed. Oh my gosh. What happened? Was there some kind of mechanical failure? Did the brakes give out? That was everyone's first thought, right. Yeah. A tragic accident. Terrible, but it happens. But here's where it gets really unsettling. The investigation, it revealed absolutely zero signs of a mechanical malfunction. What? You're saying the train was in perfect working order? Perfect working order. The driver, Leslie Newson, he was a seasoned veteran. He could have stopped that train at any time. So if it wasn't an accident, are you saying he did this on purpose? The evidence points to a deliberate act. Newson, for reasons that we still don't fully understand, he drove that train directly into the station wall. 43 people died in that crash, including Newson himself. I, I don't even know what to say. That's just horrifying. What could possibly drive someone to do something like that? I mean, were there any warning signs, anything in his past that could explain this? That's what's so perplexing about this case. There was absolutely nothing to indicate that Newsom was suicidal or that he was struggling with any kind of mental health issues. So it's a complete mystery. It really is. His colleagues, they said he'd been in good spirits that day. He was acting completely normal. No note, no history of instability, nothing. It's cases like this that make those everyday anxieties we all feel like, what if the train malfunctions? Yeah. They just seem almost insignificant in comparison. This was something else entirely. It really makes you think about the mystery is hidden within the human mind, doesn't it? Sometimes the most unsettling mysteries are those we may never find answers to. I think you're right. It's a lot to process. So for our next case, let's shift gears, shall we? We're leaving the confines of the London underground and heading to the stark beauty of Norway for this one. Norway. Okay. What kind of mystery are we tackling now? This one's called Into the Valley of Death. And it starts in 1970 when a woman's body is discovered in this desolate remote valley near Bergen, Norway. Now the cause of death was ruled a sleeping pill overdose. But here's the chilling part. She was still alive when her body was set on fire. Oh my God, that is horrifying. Okay, so who was this woman? And was it murder made to look like an accident? Those are the million dollar questions. See, the thing is, all identification had been removed from her clothing, her belongings, everything. She was a complete enigma. A Jane Doe. So how do they even begin to investigate? Where do you even start with a case like that? Well, it started with a stroke of luck, really. Two suitcases were found at a nearby train station, and they were later confirmed to belong to the woman. 
And inside those suitcases, they found a really bizarre collection of items. Okay, like what? Wigs, different currencies, and most intriguing of all, a diary written in code. A coded diary. Okay, now this is sounding like a spy thriller. Did they ever crack the code? They tried, but sadly, no. They weren't able to decipher it. But they were able to piece together some of her travels from the items they found. Oh. And it seemed like she was using different aliases, different passports. It was like she was determined to erase her past, to just disappear. Wow, to live in the shadows like that. Was she a spy? On the run from something? It's impossible to say for sure, and that's part of what makes this case so intriguing. It's those unanswered questions that keep these mysteries alive, don't they? They really do. We may never have all the pieces, but it doesn't stop us from trying to assemble the puzzle, even if it's incomplete. I love that about these kinds of mysteries. Sometimes the journey through the unknown is even more fascinating than any answer we could come up with. You know, you're right. And speaking of journeys, our next case takes us on a journey across the high seas. Oh, Intrigued, what's the story? This one involves a tale of mutiny, lost gold, and a ship that seemingly vanished without a trace. Okay, I'm hooked. Tell me everything. So picture this. It's 1853. A ship called the Madagascar set sail from Melbourne, Australia, bound for London, England. A long voyage. And what was the ship carrying? Oh, she was loaded with passengers and a fortune in gold bullion. Gold bullion. Okay, now that's a recipe for trouble, especially back in those days. Was there any indication that something was wrong? Well, from the very beginning, this voyage seemed to be cursed. They were shorthanded on crew because a bunch of them deserted before they even left port. Deserted? Why? Who knows? Maybe they had a bad feeling about the trip. But anyway, because of that, they had to hire a bunch of last-minute replacements. And let's just say these new additions to the crew... They weren't exactly known for their upstanding morals. Okay, so we've got a ship full of gold, a questionable crew, and a long journey ahead. I'm starting to get a bad feeling about this. What happened? Well, to no one's surprise, I'm sure, the Madagascar sailed right into the Hall of Fame of Maritime Mysteries by disappearing without a trace. The whole ship gone! Gone. Wow. So and what do they think happened? Well, the most likely explanation, given the circumstances, is mutiny. Plain and simple. These less-than-savory characters, they saw their chance, a ship full of riches, vulnerable passengers, and the vast ocean to swallow up any evidence. The classic pirate tale. But is there any actual evidence to support this theory, or is it just speculation? This is where it gets interesting, because decades after the Madagascar vanished, a supposed survivor came forward. A survivor? After oh. all those years? You got it. This woman, claiming to have been a nanny aboard the Madagascar, she shared her story on her deathbed. A deathbed confession. Talk about dramatic. Right. And according to her account, it was just as we imagined a mutiny. The captain officers murdered. The ship intentionally set ablaze. And the mutineers escaping with all that gold. Wow. What a story. But how reliable is her account after all these years? Memories can fade. Details get distorted. Exactly. And that's the thing. We'll never know for sure. Is her story the truth? Or is it a tale woven from trauma and time, distorted over the years? It's the ultimate unsolved mystery. And in a way, I kind of like it that way. The not knowing allows us to come up with our own conclusions. I agree. It's like we're all handed the last page of a mystery novel. You know, the climax is revealed, but the journey to get there, that's left entirely up to our imaginations. I like that analogy. And on that note, we've reached the end of our journey through the pages of Unexplained Book 5. From ghostly whispers to vanished ships, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've confronted the unexplainable, questioned our perceptions, maybe even felt a shiver or two down our spines. I know I have. And while some people might find these stories unsettling, I actually think they serve a really important purpose. Oh. And what's that? They remind us of the vastness of what we don't know. They keep us humble and curious. The world is full of mysteries, and while some of them may never be solved, that shouldn't stop us from searching for answers. That's a great note to end on. Embrace the mystery. Well said. And who knows, maybe one day we'll have a new episode of The Deep Dive and finally reveal the answers to some of these unsolved mysteries. But until then, keep exploring and stay curious.